like all of these like, you know, filters and stuff on this side. And then here, what we have is like the individual searches, right? You got like your people and you know, that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> Going on here, right? So there's a couple filters that I recommend using that are like gonna help you get really low hanging fruit is what I call it. And one is there's a filter in here called past company. Hmm. So what you can do that's pretty cool is uh, two things with that filter. One, you can take existing customers of your current company. So think about like the so you're selling software, maybe you're selling professional services. Who are the existing customers of that company, of your current company, excuse me, and put those companies into the past company filter. And what you're going to get when you run a persona-based search, so let's say for me, I'm searching for chief revenue officers and VPs of sales, and I put in my current clients or anyone I've worked with in the past into the past company filter, what I can then do is see people that used to work for a company that was a client of mine, and then now I can reach out to them at their new company. It's like, it's like the warmest cold outreach you'll do when you can say, hey, I saw you used to work at ABC company. We, I don't know if you were there when we did this work for them, but they had this problem. I'd love to share with you how, we're, you know, how we help them and see if it might be something that we could help you with, All right? So that's the past company filter. There's another way that you can use this too that I like, and think about the companies that you have worked for in the past. So another uh, company I worked for was called College Works Painting, right? So what I did in college is I went door to door uh, selling house painting services. And you know what? A lot of people work for College Works Painting and then go become sales leaders of other companies. So I could put that into the past company filter and look for people that I used to work with. So think about like your past companies. There might be some gold there too, where you could say who did I work at the same company with that is now in a leadership position at another company that I could prospect to. So that's a really cool one. And then lastly, what you have here is like on the right, and you're gonna have to excuse like the chicken scratch. It's way faster to do this than for me to open up Sales Navigator on a Zoom call because it loads super slow. Um, so the, another thing you can do is um, you can do your normal persona-based search. You could say, hey, I'm looking for a, a chief revenue officer, VP of sales at a 500 person company in computer software industry. And then if you scroll to the very right on these little tabs that show up at the top, what you can do is look for companies, or uh, sorry, people that follow your company on LinkedIn. So um, one of the companies, uh, oftentimes we work with companies that are pretty big. So they have like four or 5,000 people that follow their company page on LinkedIn. So that's another way you can get your foot in the door is like, I can run my persona based search for prospects and see if, that, if there's anyone that's already following my company on LinkedIn. So those are like two or three like really quick tangible things you can do like right away um, to find some low hanging fruit on LinkedIn. I really love the idea of reaching out to people that you've already sold to um, and yeah. seeing if they're at, you know, in past lives and seeing where they're at now. I know for myself, um, that has been such a useful tool. And honestly, it is one of the biggest testaments of never burning a bridge and the value of multi-threaded approaches as well. Because whenever you get to talk to 10 people in an org, and those 10 people all go to a new role and then they all go to other roles, you know, you're able to really have a stronger foothold. So I really, I love that idea. Um, that's such, you know, tactical information right there. Our next question is from Joe Latchaw and his question is around analytics. Um, that's something he struggles with. And so he's wondering, how do you get better at understanding analytics? How do you get better at, creating templates that are relevant? What does that look like? So I looked at this question. I don't really understand, like what I want to know is like, why do you want to get better at, at, at analytics? Mm -hmm. um, well, here. Like for what purpose? Um, and if you're on the call, like yeah. Joe, are you on the call? He is. Yeah, Jay Bay, what, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's going on, dude? Yeah, oh, can I'll you help like, me out here? Just give yeah, me a little yeah, bit more, sure. like what are you trying to accomplish here? And, I, and I'll do my best to help you. Sure. So working at a SaaS company, we have data across two CRMs, which I already know that's kind of like the, the no-no. <laughs> but yeah. the biggest thing that we struggle with is both systems pull different fields of data. And so I'm, I'm tasked now with building out this template and trying to make it all make sense. And it's, it's just a beast, yeah. man. So I don't know like, if you 
have like connections that are just more analytical mindset. Cause you know, I'm sure that Katie will tell you I'm like trench warrior, you know, roll up <laughs> yeah. sleeves, you know, get dirty in the sales. And then now, you know, my boss is asking, you know, well, tell me what does all this mean? And I know what it means, but she wants to see it more from the analytical approach. So hopefully that might help, but I already know we've kind of got, you know, <laughs> some bad stuff going on with two different systems and such. So what I would think about is like, what does your boss want? Okay. So like, what do they, what do they want to use the analytics for? Like, what is the okay. why component behind this? So typically it's going to probably going to be a few things. Um, people are going to want to know, like typically in my experience is I call this the five rights. Okay. So people are typically going to want to know these things. They're going to want to know, are we going after the right company? Are we going after the right people? at those companies. So do the companies we're reaching out to, sorry, that's a little blurry, you guys. There we <laughs> go. So are the companies that we're reaching out to, do these reflect like our target accounts, the logos that we want to go after, et cetera? Are the people, like, are we engaging high enough up, you know, VP, C level, et cetera? Um, are we sending the right message? So this is our people replying to our emails. Are they opening them? Um, what percentage of the people that we reach out to are we able to contact, et cetera? Right, so you got one, two, three, four is, are we using the right channels? So a lot of times that's what people wanna know is, hey, uh, should we be focusing more on phone? Should we be focusing more on email? Have we used LinkedIn, et cetera? And then the fifth one is right number of touches. These are typically the things that lead to like closing deals. And, you know, with, with me, like the step before that, obviously, is like, are, are we getting those first round, like meetings so that we can actually create an opportunity? So what I would dig through is maybe do an exercise like, hey, what are you trying to figure out? Like, how do you want to use the data? And you're probably going to find that they're going to want stuff that fits into these five buckets. Are we reaching out to the right companies? Do we know that we're engaging enough people and the right people? Do we know that our messaging is working? Do we know that we're engaging them on enough channels? And are we engaging them enough? Like what I want to know when I go into a company is like all of those things. And this is where I see, like, I'll ask them, how many times do you reach out to someone before stopping? And usually people are like, yeah, probably four or five times. I'm like, well, you need to basically double that <laughs> at least. Um, so this will allow you to use the data in a way that can actually be helpful. So I'll give you one more example. So what you can figure out is like, um, hey, you run a search on the companies and they don't quite fit your guys' ideal client profile. So now your boss can look at this and say, we have a targeting problem. We're not reaching out to the right companies, right? So you can use the data in, in one of these five ways. So like your question, if we kind of step back around analytics, I think it's, it sounds more like what you're looking for is like, how do I take this information and present it in a way that my boss will actually find actionable and helpful, you know, for us. And this is where I get started now. Okay. Thank you so much. That's awesome. Help you out? Yeah, that does. That, that makes so much sense. Thanks again for answering that. Cool. Yeah, absolutely, man. You bet. So, Jason, one of the things that you were kind of talking about is um, how so many people that we just that we talk with about prospecting and um, they're they're spending three or four touches on people instead of the the real amount that they probably yeah. should. Um, we've got a question from Eddie, and and it really ties into this. Well, is that there's a lot of reports showing that cold calling now has a two and a half percent success rate. What one, do you agree? Do you not agree? Why? What does that look like? How do you, how do you deal with beating that trend? Okay. So first off, um, I think there's a couple of points here and sorry, ran out of room there. <laughs> um, I think there's a couple things to take in consideration. Uh, one cold calling is not dead. Um, yes. I, ha I can show you every counter argument to that study. Um, I did look at the study. Uh, the other thing too is that study was done with people selling real estate. So they were cold calling consumers selling real estate. I think Keller Williams was the one that sponsored the study. So I also think about like, um, where can I get unbiased information? Um, no different than, uh, we will get into politics, but think about where you <laughs> consume your political news, right? Because um, HubSpot has articles also that talk about cold calling instead. Well, yeah. public, a HubSpot is a publicly traded company that sells inbound marketing solutions. It's kind of in their best interest to talk about cold calling being dead. Okay, so I think there's a couple elements here that if we kind of step back, and it's, I don't think the argument is really like around like whether cold calling is dead, 
from a salesperson standpoint, I think it's more about like what works to get a hold of the people I'm trying to get a hold of. Yes. And cold calling, if you're just calling, like you're really, really limiting your opportunity to actually get a hold of someone. So I think the bigger question to think about is like, what's the best contact strategy, right? So the best contact strategy, uh, a good way to get started is you can kind of use this weekly touch pattern as a way to get started. So there's a couple techniques I recommend because uh, I saw a lot of other questions were around like low response rates and like people not answering my calls either. So the way that you want to think about this is like, how can I get all three of these tools to work together? So if we look at a, like a cadence or a sequence, mm -hmm. you could follow this weekly pattern. So on day one, you're going to do a technique that's called a triple touch. So essentially what you're going to do is combine phone, email, and LinkedIn, and you're going to do all of those actions together simultaneously. And what you want to think about is the user experience for the prospect receiving this, we want to create a multi-channel experience for them, right? So what you want to do is first you want to call and then leave a voicemail. And that voicemail, if you, well, obviously, if they pick up the phone, we can talk about what to say, you know, about that. But let's say you get a voicemail, you're actually going to point this voicemail to the email that you send. So just because people are not picking up the phone doesn't mean that it's not a good idea to listen to or that they don't listen to voicemails or get a transcription of their voicemail email to them. So what we're going to do is figure out like, how can we get the phone working with the email? So when you leave the voicemail at the end of it, the call to action is going to be, I'm going to send you an email in the subject line. There's two of them that I really like that have pretty good open rates uh, is, Hey Katie, just left a voicemail. So I'm going to say, uh, Hey Katie, uh, no need to call me back. I'm going to send you an email right now that says, Hey Katie, just left a voicemail in the subject line. And I'm going to have a case study of a similar company that was dealing with a problem that you guys might be having that I was curious about. And again, check your email I'm about to send it right now. It's Hey Katie, just left a voicemail. The other one that you can do too is voicemail from Jason Bay. And that almost looks like a, like a notification email, right? That you got a voicemail. Yep. So I'm going to point that voicemail to the email and then I can send a LinkedIn connection request, or you can follow them or you can like or comment, do some sort of touch on LinkedIn. So there's three touches in one day right there. And then on day three, what you're going to do is you're going to call no voicemail, and then you're going to do an email follow up that's going to be on the same thread as this email. And this is going to be an any thoughts email. So all the email is going to say is any thoughts, Jason, that's all the email is going to say. And it's going to be on the same email chain. You're going to reply all to this email, which you can do automatically if you have a sales engagement tool like outreach or sales loft or Apollo or vanilla soft or the many, many sales engagement platforms out there now. <laughs> Um, so that's what I would be thinking about is like, how can I run this weekly touch pattern three weeks in a row? That'll give you 15 touches. So like with contact rates, the way to boost the contact rate is you want to do uh, multi-touch. So you want at least 12 to 15 plus touches. You also want to do multi-channel. So that's two to three channels. And then you want that spread out over 30 to 45 days. So this would be a pretty aggressive one that you could do five points of contact each week. You could do a Tuesday, Thursday, the next week you could do a Wednesday, Friday, you could do a Tuesday, Friday, whatever it might be. Like this is that contact strategy that I would recommend so that you can make the phone work together with the email and you're creating a multi-channel experience for the prospect on their end. You know what I really love about this, Jason, is that it's, it's, well, first off, it sounds like a lot, right? It sounds like, oh my gosh, five touches, that's a lot, but it's not. Whenever you think of three of the touches are on one day, right? That's, that's not that much. And then the next two are on another day. It's not like you're touching every single day. It's, it's definitely more strategic. I also really love how you're tying in um, every single one of your touches. There's a purpose and it's relating to some other previous touch that you've had, right? So many of us 
are sending so much crap <laughs> to our prospects or our customers and none of them are related to what we even call them about most of the time. It's, yeah. here's a case study because my boss says I should send you a case study and this sounds like a great idea, yeah. but I never even reference the case study whenever I call them to follow up about it. And so I love that this approach is really uh, in synchronization with everything in the messaging behind it. Yes. So you bring up some really good points there because the common challenge I hear is, well, Jason, holy shit, man. Like there's a lot of tensions here. Where does the content, I don't have time to write that many emails. Well, what you can do is like this email here, like you focus on a problem. Mm -hmm. So one problem, what is the most common problem that the person you're reaching out to likely has that you can help them with? And this is like kind of a longer form email. And then you do an any thoughts on the same email chain. The next week you pick problem number two. And you write that longer email and then a, a variation of an any thoughts week three, same kind of thing. When you call and leave a voicemail, you're going to use the same messaging from this email. You're going to talk about the same problem, the same personalization, like same thing. So think about how you can like repurpose and get as much mileage out of all the work that you did to create this message, get as much mileage out of that as possible. Uh, Nikki asked, what do touches six through 12 look like similar pattern? Yep. Exactly the same pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And River sounds like, yeah, sounds like River is actually doing this, basically this exact strategy, right? Doing a triple touch, reaching out again with an any thoughts email, uh, which he calls a nudge. Mm -hmm. And that works for real. Yeah. This, this works extremely, assuming that the message is good, obviously, right? Yeah. Assuming that you got some good stuff to share. Yeah. And, you know, one of our uh, other community members, they'd also asked, and this ties in perfectly, whenever we're looking at subject lines, so you've shared two or three of, of your top favorite subject lines. Why, why are they clickable? How do you, how do you figure out what are the most clickable? And, and selfishly, I've always wondered, do those crazy buzzy ones actually work? And, and what does that look like? How to write that successfully? Yeah. So there's a couple of frameworks that I like with subject lines and I'll just kind of give you like the template for it so that you can customize. Um, so keep in mind with open rates, it's more than just the subject line. It's also the first line of your email. So if the first line of your email says, hey, Katie, my name is Jason Bay with Blissful Prospecting, just keep in mind that you're starting your email like every single salesperson starts their email and you're making it about you. So mm -hmm. the first line of the email is extremely important too. So with subject lines, there's a couple of um, things that you can implement that are actually like pretty easy. Uh, there's something that I call rule of three. And essentially what you're doing is you want to create a bit of a pattern interruption. So we talk about pattern interruption. It's essentially creating like some novelty for the prospect and doing something unique that will stick out compared to what they normally get. So rule of three is you can pick out what seem like three random things. And I'm going to look at that subject line. I'm going to wonder how, how are those things connected? So I'll give you some examples here in a second, but the formula is you want to do some sort of personalization. And then you can use a comma and then you can do company name. And then you can do like the year, for example. So you could do 2021. So two out of three of these things you can populate with merge tags, right? You're going to have the company's name and the year in here, and then you're going to personalize this first little bit. So one of the things that um, to think about, so I have a company that I work with that um, they consult around cost solutions. So like helping them reduce costs around overspending on their utilities. One of the things they look for is, does this company care about sustainability? Because if the company talks about sustainability, that's the personalization trigger. Yeah. So what the subject line looked like was this. Sustainability. ABC Manufacturing. 2021. So that's the personalized piece company name, and then the year. And I'm just giving you some examples of stuff that you could do. This is kind of the most common one that I see. Um, another angle that you could take that's kind of cool is if you can find something personal to the prospect, you could put three seemingly random things in there as well. So for example, um, if I go to the person's LinkedIn profile and I notice that uh, under their work experience, they talk about an accomplishment, if we're using this example around how much money they've been able to save the company that they work with. That's, that's like a really common thing. There's some sort of metric, right? So I could take that percentage and I could go like this, 215% 
cost savings, uh, and then like name of company. So I can use different variations of this. I would try to use two out of the three that you pick, make those something that like is repeatable for you that you can do with merge tags and kind of templatize and then customize the first part of it. Um, so this is what I see working really well. I already gave you um, the next one, which was like the second one is like the voicemail trick. So leave a voicemail first and then send an email with the subject line just left you a voicemail, right? That's another really easy one. And then the third one is uh, I like to see, say, be a little bit mysterious, you know, create some intrigue. Like this one works really well. Hi, uh, first name. Let's go like that. Sorry, it's a little messy here. I was researching your company and I was researching ABC company and dot, dot, dot. That is like my go-to uh, subject line there. All of these, when used correctly, have 50% plus, plus uh, open rates in my experience. So you could do kind of the mysterious approach. You could say, hey, Katie, I was researching sales hacker and dot, dot, dot. And you know, when someone says they're researching you, it, it creates a lot of intrigue, right? I, I want to know what they said, mm -hmm. right? What they found. So those are three pretty quick things that you can do with subject lines. Um, keep in mind, with the subject line, again, I cannot iterate enough. Like if the next, if the first sentence of your email then talks all about you, like they can see that in the preview text. So whether they click on the email, it's the subject line and the first sentence of your email as well. Interesting. So, um, so, okay. So what do we say to, I see this most commonly in SDRs or those in their first sales role when they're being trained to write Hey, Jason, this is Katie Ray from Sales Hacker. We solve this. We help customers like you do this. What do we do with that? Do we keep that? Do we throw it out? How do we, how do we change that? We have to absolutely change that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so what I'm hearing there is this kind of like, um, you know, what's the framework for a good message, right? Um, is, is kind of what I'm hearing the bigger question there. So I have something, uh, so Nathan, it looks like, and Nathan, I recognize your name too, man. So it's good to see you here. Uh, Nathan uses the reply method, right? Uh, that we came up with. So the reply method, so reply is an acronym. And uh, so the R is for relevant results. The E is for empathy. The P is for personalization. I'm just going to focus on those three parts right now because that's the structure of your message. So the structure of like a good message, so this could be email or cold call or whatever it might be, it's going to be like reverse order of this. Hmm. So what we need to think about, if there's one keystone habit that I could share with you that would help with everything you do prospecting and selling wise, it would be this concept of you first, me second. You as the prospect first, I need to get you what you want, Katie, because I'm reaching out to you. You didn't ask me to reach out to you. I need to get you what you need first, and then I can ask for what I want. So the way the email would be structured is, uh, you know, hi, Katie. We have our personalization piece. So I'm starting with something about them, and I can kind of give you a little fill on the word template here in a second. We're going to empathy, so this is the problem. And then we can talk about relevant results how we can help, how other companies are being helped. And then you're gonna have your call to action. So with the emails, um, I know that there's a lot of content out there on so-and-so use this email template and they got 35% response rates. Don't copy and paste their email template because it's so specific for them that it's not gonna probably apply to you and your situation, right? So we open up an email, we do think about like, how can we start about something that's important to Katie? Mm. So, hey Katie, and you can use this kind of template saw blank looks like blank um hey saw one of the things that's uh, really important to you on your linkedin is um i don't know if we're using like you as an example right now what's what's your uh, title again at sales hacker community engagement manager community engagement manager so let's say that i was on your linkedin it's like um hey saw that you're the community engagement manager at sales hacker um what you said about um, the fact that you've grown the community by X percentage uh, is super awesome. Or hey, looks like growing the community is something you've been really focused on and have done 
uh, really great job with, like super impressed with the results, right? Uh, one challenge that I'm hearing, or hey, a challenge I hear from other people managing large communities like yours, is that it can be challenging rounding people up and getting them to show up to webinars and, and like keeping them really engaged. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that other communities are solving that problem is they're doing X, Y, and Z. Is that something you'd be interested in hearing more about? And I'm going to follow that format. I'm going to, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to talk about you in this email first. And then I'm going to talk about what problems like people, uh, problems that people like you have. I'm not going to say, hey, Katie, uh, you're probably not able to get as much engagement as you'd like, right? It's like, that's kind of insulting, right? I'm not going to say you have a problem. I'm going to say, people like you sometimes share with me that they have this problem. Mm -hmm. And here's what they're doing to solve for it and how we're helping them. Are you interested in chatting? And this is the same format that you can use when you're cold calling. So someone asked about cold call openers and we could dig more into that, but you're essentially gonna do a permission-based opener and then you're gonna use this same format. Hey Katie, Jason with Old School Prospecting. Look, I know I probably caught you in the middle of something, but do you have a minute? I can tell you why I'm calling and you can let me know if you wanna keep chatting. Yeah, and then I go into this. I was on your LinkedIn profile and I noticed this thing. A problem that I hear is this. One of the ways that companies are fixing it is this. Um, can I ask you like two or three questions just to see if this would be relevant for you? Yeah. And then we can go to the rest of our cold call. So this message right here, like that framework, mm -hmm. that's the one that you want to get down right there. Mm. Yeah. I really love that. You know, I think we had, we had uh, hit on this a bit too at, um, during our live event with you that asking for permission and, and customers and prospects really appreciate that. Um, yeah. I love this. And I, I think River, this is probably going to help you a lot too. You're saying that you're struggling with putting so much information to your first email, everything that you're saying, Jason, this could be three or four lines, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's actually the L part of reply. This laser focus is like, how can I get this email below 120 words? Um, River, are you, can you take yourself off mute real quick? Okay, fine. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that might help you, cause you said that, Hey, I, you know, how can I cut down my email when we feel like we can help with so much? Mm -hmm. Like what are the top two or three like areas you guys feel like you can really help your prospects? Like what are those like buckets of areas that you can help them with? Well, because during COVID um, cost saving is usually one of the large pieces and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I won't go into specific details of what we do cause it's a bit uh, complicated, but Essentially, cost saving uh, is probably, I'd say, number one. Uh, two is efficiency, time saving. So larger companies, obviously, time is money as well. Yep. Um, and then three, probably like competitor analysis and competitor intelligence, benchmarking. Okay. So what, thank you for sharing, man. So what you're going to want to do is like figure out like what are the problems associated with each of these areas? These are the relevant results piece that you can help with. So the empathy piece would be like, what problems do people have in each of these areas? And the way that you can shorten down that first email is don't talk about all three of them in the first email. Talk about one of them. So if we look at the contact strategy, that first email is gonna talk about one of those problems, cost savings. And my whole, that whole week, all of my messaging is gonna be geared around cost savings. And then week number two, I'm gonna run the same format, but I'm gonna focus on the efficiency piece. And then the competitor analysis. So that way you always have something new to share when you're prospecting. Hmm. Yep. Well, and that kind of goes into the second triangle, right? Whenever we're looking at the email that you just had up of, we're going to solve one problem this week. We're going to show you how we solve one yep. problem. And you, whenever you break it into those three buckets, you could probably even break each of those categories into two other ones. And then you have yeah. your whole you have your whole content for that whole stretch of, of prospecting, right? Exactly. Yeah. And you know, the cool part is like with sequencing, I think the daunting part can be, dude, I got to create a 15 touch sequence. No, just, just create the first week's worth of work. Just do the first touch, <laughs> right? If you create the first day's worth of stuff that buys you a couple days to do the next thing. And the next thing's pretty easy. You're just calling and you're sending an any thoughts email, you know, so just take it one week at a time and then you can adjust as you go. And what you might find, which we always do, is that, you know what, one of these problems tends to resonate more with the people I'm reaching out to than the others. So then you shift them. You're like, you know what, people seem to respond later in the sequence to competitor analysis. What if I started with that? Mm. What if I led with that? 
And the thing I like about cold calling is I can get immediate feedback. So think about the feedback you get from your cold emails. And if you talk about cost savings and problems associated with that, and when you do a cold call, people are like, uh, no, we're good, dude. <laughs> like, I don't have that problem at all. Well, maybe that's not as big of a problem as you think it is, right? Maybe people yeah. don't care about that. Maybe they care more th about the efficiency factor, right? And the, the time that they're wasting doing the process manually or whatever it might be. So like be super agile with this. Look at this as like, I don't need to like pre-plan everything in advance. Like I can change my messaging as I go based on what resonates with people. That's a really good point. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too. I think if you add all three of those topics into one email and they, they don't resonate with all of them, or maybe they only resonate with one of them, you're probably, it's not going to stick as much. Yeah. Um, so we've got another great question for you. I know we're slowly but surely coming up here towards the end. Um, Nathan Eesman, I don't know if he's on here. There you are, Nathan. Um, he had asked, what's your favorite opening line on a cold call um, to disrupt the buyer? I'm going to add a few questions in here as well because um, there's a, a few similar ones of how do we get responses when people are starting a screen. So what's good interest for cold calls and how do you handle the screened calls? And, and, and I'm sure we've all gotten those horrible responses <laughs> of how the hell did you get my number? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah. So. so it sounds like there's like an objection handling piece to this too. Um, <laughs> A little bit. So Nathan, um, so I can give you the formula, man, um, for like how to do a permission-based opener. And I think what you can do with your team is like actually like kind of brainstorm and create some together. So basically a permission-based opener um, is got three elements. So there's an empathize element to this. So there's the empathize piece plus a request for a specific amount of time plus asking for permission. So the most common one that you've probably heard that's one that I teach a, a lot is, hey, I know I probably caught you in the middle of something. The empathize is like, I'm acknowledging the situation, what they might be thinking, what they might be feeling, et cetera. But do you have 30 seconds for me to tell you why I'm calling, right? I'm uh, giving an, a, a specific amount of time. Sometimes I say, hey, do you have a minute? I have a client that says, hey, do you have one to two minutes for me to tell you why I'm calling? And then you can tell me if you want to keep chatting. And like eight or nine times out of 10 people say yes. Like I find your tonality during when you say this is more important. Um, than what you actually say, as long as it's got these elements. And then you ask for permission. And then you can decide if you want to keep chatting. So like a way that you could kind of be in the moment with this is like, if I'm making calls on a Monday morning, I might say something like, Hey, I know it's Monday morning. You probably got a you know, bunch of meetings planned the rest of the day. So I'll make this quick. Do you have 30 seconds where I can tell you why I'm calling? And then you can tell me if you want to keep chatting. That's good. Hey, Jason, do you, um, do you encourage people to state, name and company first? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So there's mixed opinions on this too. I, I don't like not introducing yourself at the beginning of the call that there's another school of thought that's like, well, make them ask you who you are. And you know what, like the number one thing that people are thinking when anytime I ask when you get a cold call is who is this? So why not reduce and relieve some of that anxiety right off the top and introduce yourself? Because what people can't stand at the beginning is when um, they're getting a call from a salesperson, it's like trying to pitch them and just like talk a bunch at the beginning. I think that's the issue I've seen in my team is they, they say, you know, name and company. And then, you know, the prospects like, who are you? What are you doing? And then they kind of launch into that. Oh, I better tell them who we are and what we do. And, and they don't, they kind of skip this step. Yeah. Uh, so I, this is the, this is the thing that you want to make sure that is a habit for them. Like, so the, um, God, we can go through a whole different other process that I could show you, but like the short answer to that is, I'm sorry, the camera keeps popping in and out here. So the short answer to your question, Nathan, is I would like really focus on like the habit portion of this. So the habit is like when the prospect asks me, wait, who are you guys? There's probably some sort of feeling that your reps have oh shoot, I, I got to really quickly pitch and like talk about what we do because they might not be interested or, or you know what, like this person's like, uh, sounds really busy or they sound like annoyed that they don't know what my company is or they're being bothered. Like I would try to pinpoint the trigger of that, like exactly what they're thinking. And like, that's where you can insert this habit. So the habit is anytime someone asks you, who, well, what company? 
you're automatically going to go into permission based opener and say, you're going to empathize and say, um, Hey, really good question. Um, happy to share. Do you have 30 seconds? I can tell you why I'm calling. And then you can let me know if you want to keep chatting. Yes. Well, the name of our company again is this. And I was reaching out because I saw this thing, personalization, uh, people like you have these problems, relevant results. Hey, is it cool if I ask you a couple more questions to see if this is relevant for you? So this is the thing that it sounds like they're skipping that you've already identified. Now you just need to be relentless, dude. Every call you listen to, it's like, hey, did you use the permission-based opener? With your team, maybe it's like, I want to see a sheet of paper at the end of the day that you take a picture of where you show me a tally of how many times you used a permission-based opener in your cold calls. But like, this is the part where you just got to be relentless, man. Let's see here. We just got another message. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. The permission based openers, those are rock solid. Um, and, and whenever you think about it, you know, these prospects that you're, that we're all talking to, they're just like us. It's just like talking to Jason or myself or Nathan or Nikki, you name it. It's just like talking to someone that you talk to every day and they want to be treated like that as well. Um, and so we've got, um, another really great question on here. What's the best way to go about conducting outbound prospecting on multiple contacts within the same org? So multi-threaded approaches. What are your, what are your thoughts, feelings about that? Yeah. So with multi-threading, there's kind of a, uh, a couple schools of thought here that I can share with you. And it's, it's really kind of more personal preference, I would say, than anything else. Uh, the bottom line is you do need to be, be engaging multiple people at the companies you're reaching out to. So you at least need to be doing that part. And the way that I would look at it is something like this. Um, so there's two options here. So what you could do is if we look at like the course of a month here, right? So you got week one, week two, week three, week four, you could go department by department. So let's say there's multiple departments that you need to weave in and talk to. And maybe one of them is it, another one of them is marketing. And then maybe it's like L and D. So you can say, I'm going to focus on like two to four prospects. So this would be like big enterprise stuff, right? Where there's cross department, you know, sort of dependency. I'm going to engage two to four people at the IT department week one, and then I'm going to let those sequences run. And then I'm going to start sequences for marketing and then L and D and then whatever other focus, or it could be IT for two weeks and then marketing for two weeks, right? So you can go by department and try to focus as much of your time with everyone you're reaching out to. Like I'm going to focus on a specific department each week. So I can get that messaging down. I can get into a rhythm with my cold calls, et cetera. And then week two, I'm just going to do the follow-ups to this, right? And I've already done the research. I've already started the sequence. I've already done all that stuff. I'm just going to kind of run what I have. And then I'm going to focus on adding in the next one. So I'm engaging multiple departments. So that's one way that you can think of it. Um, the other way too is let's say there's only one department and it's maybe it's more of like a mid market, you know, kind of thing that you're selling where, yeah, you need to reach out to multiple people, but there's not like cross department, like buy them that you need to get, I would just do like two to four people for mid-market and then probably do four to eight people for enterprise. And you can engage all of those people almost at the same time. Like I would spread this stuff out where like, hey, if I start a sequence on a Tuesday with someone at a company, I'm gonna start the next sequence at the, for the next person on a Wednesday then on a Thursday, maybe then on a Friday, I'm going to spread them out so they're not getting all of the same like outreach at the same time. But that's how I, I wouldn't overthink it. Yeah, that's, that's, that's as simple as I would make it. Either go department by department, week over week, or maybe for, an, for a month, all you do is say, I'm going to focus on IT departments this month of my accounts, and then I'm going to move to another you know, department. And if you're not doing something like, like I said, that's cross department like this, pick two to four people at a time for a mid-market solution, 48 for enterprise, and just work them. Like, don't overthink it. You can reach out to the same people at the same time. Great, great advice. Um, I, we've only got time for about probably one more question here. I want to give uh, this question from Ignacio. He's coming in from um, the UK. I really, I think it's thoughtful. And, and one of the things I do want to point out was that he started his question with, I think this may be a little bit more basic, but honestly, I think every single seller has been struggling with this, especially with COVID and everyone moving remotely when we've tried to call and they don't have their office line set to their computer, or we've tried to email, we tried the LinkedIn and people just aren't as responsive. Sometimes how, 
how do we best go about connecting with people that were just struggling to get on the phone? I'm sure yeah, you've, really you've been tasked with this question many times. Yeah. So if we go back to the five rights, like what I'm thinking about is like, if I'm not getting enough meetings, I'm going to think about a couple of things. Yeah. Uh, so one, like make sure, am I reaching out to the right company, but also am I reaching out to enough new companies? Some, sometimes what I find is that people work the same accounts over and over yeah. and over again. It's like, dude, just let it rest. Work yeah. it for a month and then let it go, right? Move on to something else. Now this part here, like the people, what's really important is like to multi-thread. And there's also like your ability to engage the assistants too. So there's a technique that you can do called the courtesy call technique. Hmm. So this is something Jordan Greek, someone in one of our prospecting boot camps, he actually came up with this. He kind of adapted it and made it his own. I thought it was pretty cool. But essentially what you're going to do with the courtesy call technique is you're going to see if you can get the assistant to help you get in contact with this person. So it sounds something like this. Um, hey, Katie, I uh, appreciate you taking my call. So if I call into like the main office line or whatever, or I get forwarded to their assistant, um, my name's Jason with Blissful Prospecting. And you know what, this, this might be like a really weird ask because <laughs> you don't know me and uh, I'm sort of calling you randomly here, but I've been emailing Nathan and he's actually opened up a lot of the emails and I was putting, putting in a courtesy call to see if he might not have any questions. It's typically what I find when people are opening a bunch of emails but haven't responded for whatever reason. And they might have some questions like, are you, are you able to by chance help me like get in touch with Nathan? And most of the time people are pretty helpful. Now they might not give you the person's cell phone number but they might be like, oh yeah, um, the best way to get a hold of him is this way. Or do you have his email address? Or hey, here's his extension. Right? So you're going to use that courtesy call technique. Say, I've been emailing so-and-so. They've been opening up some of my emails. And I was wondering if you might be able to help me out. He's been opening a lot of them. And I didn't know. You probably would know better than I, Katie. Like, is there maybe a better way to get a hold of them? Do you have like an extension or anything like that that you might be able to share? Hmm. So ask the assistant for help. Right? So am I reaching out to the right company? Am I reaching out to enough new companies? Am I reaching out to the assistants? So I'm mean, not just trying to work around the assistant every time and actually seeing if I can get them to help me. And then usually what I find, it's like one of these three things. Is the message you're sending resonating with the people you're sending it to? Are you talking about the right problem? Um, are you engaging them on two or more channels? Are you hitting the 12 plus touches mark? You know, here, it's, it's usually one of these five things that you're not hitting if the response rates are low. Because yeah. we have people that get 20% response rates in COVID. We have people that have 10% pickup rates when they go to make cold calls. You know, so like people are picking up the phone. They are responding to emails. You just need to kind of figure out and troubleshoot what, which one of these areas you think it might be. Hmm. Hi, Katie and Jason. Can you hear me? I wanted to ask a question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is uh, Michael calling from Boston to go to market pros. Um, I've been doing a lot of research on uh, how the top 5% of people, salespeople get meetings. And uh, it's completely fascinating um, what's coming out of it. But one of the things is that they don't reach out to companies based on what the company's doing, or they're not trying to demonstrate their knowledge of the company. What they do is they reach out to prospects based on what the prospect's competitor is doing and what the prospect's customer is doing. So, so for example, if you were targeting Target, the retail store, and you reached out to them, say, hey, I just had a great conversation with Sephora, um, and they're doing some really cool stuff on advanced marketing personalization. Would love to share that with you and see what you think. Um, that is an absolute powerful door opener. It's used by, it's used by the top one or 2%. And I, I'd be interested in your perspective of, you know, do you tell them you know a lot about them, which they already know, or do you tell them you know a lot about their competitors, which they don't know, and, and what are some of the trade-offs there? Interesting question. I like the technique that you're talking about. That is a very good technique, right, to talk about how you're working with their competition or people like them. What I would challenge maybe, though, is like, I don't think that you actually know very much about the companies you're reaching out to unless you have talked to people at those companies. So like, I try not to take that angle because like, how much do you really know when you're prospecting to someone, like how they do things internally? Now, if you have had the conversations totally. Um, so there's, I think a couple things that you could do to implement what you're talking about, Michael, because it's really good is like with multi-threading, like you can also do what, uh, so this is something I see top reps do is like bottoms up approach also. So one thing that I'll do when I'm prospecting is I'll actually talk to reps, even at really big companies, thousand plus people, 
I'll ask them, dude, what are you struggling with right now when it comes to prospecting? And they're pretty candid. Hey, we're doing personalization at scale right now and it takes too long. And like the emails take way too long, right? People aren't responding. Now I can then reach out to the VP of sales and say, Hey, I weren't, you know, I'm sure you're aware, but I've talked to so-and-so and what they're telling me is a really big focus for you guys right now. Cause you have this new product that you're trying to, to get out into the market is that uh, you guys are bought into personalization at scale, but it's just taking way too long and you're worried about like their productivity. I'd love to share with you how other companies like A, B, and C, you pick companies that are similar to them, are solving this problem right now, or how they're doing personalization at scale in a way that's efficient and still gets the meetings that they want. So you can kind of blend two of those things, but I think uh, with that approach that you talked about, Michael, like you really do have to have good intel because you don't want to go into that first meeting and not have anything good to show, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very true. Totally shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. And it works very well. Like sometimes a company might not have a lot of great case studies. Um, mm -hmm. Like I do a lot of work in retail and e-commerce and, and my clients sold to Sears and I'm like, Sears is going down the toilet. Uh, so when you're, you know, pulling out the Sears case study, you know, it's a negative, right? Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, if you've able to have five quality conversations um, with five top retailers, you can leverage that. And what I find is prospects don't care whether you've sold to their competitors they just care whether you've talked to them and have insight yeah. so so it's kind of you actually go out of your way to get those conversations and then pull that insight back into into your selling yeah no that's that's a really great technique man awesome cool. thank you michael that's really really great insight um okay so we are getting to the top of the hour we've had great discussion or i'm sorry the bottom of the hour uh, we've had great discussions ranging from the best subject lines that we should be using, different sequences that we can utilize to get the most touch with the most content in it. Jason has wowed us all again, all of us millennials, with the fabulous use of projectors. <laughs> I know some of you have actually asked, how does he do that? So he's about to get some LinkedIn intros to help share that. Um, but we do have two fabulous um, community members that shared um, some really great discussions and great questions um, that are going to be contacted separately um, to get um, all access to the Prospecting Plays Chorus from Jason and then also a Sales Hacker t-shirt. So we're super excited about that. Um, and the recording will be sent uh, I'm trying to think of what else, Jason, is there anything else that you want to add to this or? Yeah, I have a free like guide you guys can check out too. I just threw it into the chat. So um, there's like some prospecting plays and like a free PDF that you can download. So if you want some like step-by-step -step things you could say in a cold call or a cold email, uh, you might check it out. And I really appreciate all the kind words in the chat too. Um, this is super fun. How do I get a sales hacker t-shirt, Katie? <laughs> Um, send me your address. Done and done. And you know what? If you're if you're really lucky, I write letters. I write handwritten letters to That's our. That's my goal. I want to get a handwritten letter from you, Katie. Done. Okay. Done. <laughs> <laughs> With a little Santa stamp. So um, yeah. I really appreciate you, Jason. I appreciate all of you that were able to join, and I hope many of you got your questions answered. Um, if you have anything that you didn't get answered, throw it a new discussion post and you have access to over 70,000 members in our sales hacker community that is going to be able to help provide some really great responses. Um, and so I'm just so appreciative. This was so much fun. I learned so much more already and we just spoke last week. So, um, Jason, thank you. Even cool. though yeah, thank you all. <laughs> and thank you for having me, Katie. Thank you, everyone. Have a fabulous day, and we'll talk soon. Yep. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Bye. Later, guys.